words of encouragement I can use use all of it I can get um, thankful for a church in Richmond that is passionate about growing young men in in their walk with the Lord and, and training them on how to go and preach the word so uh, uh, the credit's not to me it's not to the church it's to Jesus Amen. Uh, so if you have your Bibles turn to the book of Jude and we'll be looking at the first four verses if you're not sure where Jude is, go all the way to the end of your Bible, the book of Revelation, and then go left. It's a short book, but, but a powerful book. Um, and I love how this Bible I have uh, explains, kind of summarizes what we'll be talking about tonight. It's, it says, maintain your life with God. Amen. And any time we come before the Word, and every time we come to church, we realize that it is a, a worship service. The worship doesn't stop when we get done singing songs. No, it continues when we baptize people, and it, and it continues even in the preaching of your Word. Amen. So with that being said, I, I ask that you would stand in reverence to the reading of God's Word. And... Where else can we go tonight and hear the words of eternal life? Amen. That's right. Where, where else can we go and see Christ but His Word? Amen. So that's exactly what we're going to see tonight. It says this, Jude, starting in verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called... Mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. It is a privilege that I do not deserve. We show every day in our lives that we do not deserve to hear from you and as we read and study your word together, as the church, we see abundant mercy and that you speak to us even when we don't want to hear from you. You hold our salvation in the palm of your hands. I pray that we would be a people that hears your word and does not let the cares of this world, even the good things that you give us, choke the word out. God, I pray that your word would cut through the callousness of our heart that the seed of the gospel would be planted. God, that it would take root and that it would produce a hundredfold of fruit by the watering of encouragement of the saints that are sitting around us. God, I ask you that you would allow these saints to see how precious your word is. God, that they need it every moment of every day. I need it every moment of every day. Help us to dwell on your word that we may be made more like Christ every day until he returns. God, show us that we must fight our way to heaven, but you will see to it that we win because of Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Three months later, I finally went back to work. You see, uh, I work in a public school, and I've had, had the summer off. And uh, as it started, I was really anxious on how I was going to spend my time over the summer. I, I was wringing my hands, and I was at one point asking people for work to do something to occupy my time to keep my mind from totally zoning out. I remember we went on vacation to Orange Beach, and I, there was one point I asked Camille, I was like, is there an itinerary for like this week? Like, I got to know how I'm going to structure my day. Uh, but there wasn't, and she's like, it's a vacation. You don't do those kinds of things. Uh, so uh, there was even one point, and I started a YouTube channel. I was trying to just find everything I could to occupy my time. So the months went on, and I, 
I found myself sitting on the couch and there was days where Camille would leave for work and I would be in the same position when she got back home. I had, had become lazy, the very thing I, that I was fighting for, uh, I had become. Uh, so this week I started back to work and I had went from zero miles an hour to 100. Monday morning I, I sat in a, a, a meeting for school and I was slurping down coffee just to stay awake. Uh, uh, that <coughs> evening I, uh, our church um, had began building wall, uh, a, a room for our children, uh, so more space, more children. And there was one night, Monday night, I was, or Wednesday night, I, uh, I was there till midnight and I was bragging to the guys on how long I had, uh, uh, had been awake. Then starting tomorrow, my Bible college classes start back. So uh, there is this work and this grit uh, that it takes to maintain, this discipline that it takes to maintain uh, this kind of lifestyle. And that's exactly what we see when we come to the first, first four verses of Jude. Uh, Jude uh, quickly identifies himself as a servant of Jesus. Now there's not much known about Jude. Uh, we read earlier in the Gospels that Jesus had four half-brothers and among those was listed uh, Judas or translated Jude. And even uh, in the book of James, he is called the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, so we see that Jude is a humble man. He identifies quickly as a servant. And it wouldn't be too far-fetched to say here that Jude would uh, recall the time where he didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. See, all of Jesus' family, when he was doing his earthly ministry, thought he was a lunatic, that he was a madman. So as he writes this introduction, I'm sure those moments were ringing in his ears, and but that God saved him, and it drove him to a position of humility. Yes. We also see that Jude is happy to be a slave. In this day and age, there are so many negative connotations that come with that, but there's n not a more appropriate word that Jude could use here. For, for there is, this is for the Christian, that is a title that we carry boldly. If we, have a, if we are a servant, we have a master. We have Amen. the master. Yes. We also see that it is a bio of our own lives. See, the Apostle Paul tells us that we are bought with a price. Uh, Sunday mornings we sing, He sought me, He bought me with His redeeming blood. Amen. Now the question is, when you sing that song, are you singing it from a point of joy or are you uh, carrying it around like it's a weight uh, that is weighing you down? So, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Like I said, this is the James that comes to mind when you think of your Bible. And that's where exactly the minds of, of the churches uh, that Jude was writing to, where their mind would have went to. They would have thought that the, the, the pastor of the Jerusalem church, the mega church who held, held tens of thousands of people, that was where their mind would have went to. That would have been exactly like if I t said the word Jordan. You automatically think Chicago Bulls. If you're young enough, you probably think Washington Wizards. Or if you're my generation, you probably think Hanes T-shirts. So the same kinds of things going on. It's stirring this, uh, these images of who Jude is. Mm -hmm. But notice the things that he's identifying with. Because I know my own heart. If I was in Jude's position, I would quickly identify as the half-brother of Jesus. I would write my letter something like this. Austin, the half-brother of Jesus. So you better listen to what I'm about to tell you because it's really important. But the verse continues. To them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called... See, what I love about the New Testament, about the, the Bible, that it is living and active. 
So that means that when he says to to those who are sanctified, it's talking about us. Yeah. He could have just as easy as said, y'all who are sanctified, called, and preserved. Uh, and just as a side note here, I, I love to get into the what we call hermeneutics of studying the Bible. That's a fancy word for interpretation. That's I'm not a heretic, I promise you. Uh, I believe that when we want to get the original meaning of the text, we have to go to the original language. But you don't have to know Greek or Hebrew. I don't know Greek or Hebrew. I have an app on my phone that knows Greek and Hebrew, and it translates it for me. So as I break these uh, phrases and words down, trust the Holy Spirit that he is the one speaking to us. I'm not speaking. Austin, it may be my voice, but it is God's word. The authority comes from him. To those who are sanctified. That easily translates as set apart. You see, God in eternity past decided that he would set us apart to show his love, to make a name for himself. Jude reminds us that of our status before God. Because as these false teachers were creeping into the church, this was somebody that couldn't identify with Christ. Because these false teachers, they would come in and they say, you must work, you must do something to get into heaven. You must have some sort of resume to show to God to get into heaven. But that is Judas already pushing that away, saying, you who are called. God has chosen you so you better fight for the faith. Amen. Amen. And it, and it continues, and preserved in Jesus Christ. And it, and it translates literally, I love you. I will protect you. I will keep you. I will guard you. And, and if you notice that this is the same kind of descriptions that we say when we Uh, uh, show someone that we love them when Camille goes to work I say I love you be careful let me know if you have any problems and I'm sure it's the same way that you uh, talk to your spouse as they are leaving for work or leaving home for whatever reason we see that love is active it's always pursuing the benefit of another's good but more than that more than God Uh, uh, preserving us on a day-to-day and providing for us. We see that God moment by moment maintains our salvation for us. He prays for our faith. Uh, By the power of the Spirit, uh, He draws us to His Word. Uh, And He, uh, um, by His grace, we will produce fruit of godliness. This is a lifelong process, something that Jesus does 24-7 365. But notice the progression of what Jude is doing here. Sanctified, preserved, and called. So first God sets us aside to show his love for us. Currently he is preserving us. And then as he's doing that, he says, I love you. I will keep you. I will provide for you. Yes, sir. And oftentimes, when I find myself praying, I thank God for the things that He does for me. But I never have in mind that He is doing so much for my salvation. God whispers to me, says, I will hold you securely in my hand, and I will see you through to the end of days. Yes, sir. Verse 2. Beloved. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should contend earnestly for the faith that was once delivered for the saints. So God, so as Jude is encouraging these believers, he's saying these things that God's doing, they are to be shown to others. Yeah. What does he cause to? He calls us to mercy, peace, and love. He's calling us to enjoy mercy. That is the outward effect that we have on others around us. Uh, These are things that are tasted by the believer, and we show them to others. God has shown us mercy. We have 
had compassion uh, given to us. Amen. One commentator even says that this is also a call to show mercy to the false teachers. They are wrong, but there is a grace among them. Enjoy peace. We should enjoy peace because ultimately in a cosmic spell, spell in a, we'll stop, in a cosmic way, uh, God has given us peace. So he is pleased with us in Christ. Uh, it's as if we have never sinned. He uh, is delights in us. Yes, in Christ, you have always pleased God. Uh, remind each other of that as you come here on Wednesday nights, as you come here on Sunday mornings, remind each other that you have that. Amen. He also calls us to enjoy love with one another. Five times he calls this church beloved. Beloved. So how do we, how do we know, how do we be loving to others? Well, we look to how God has loved us. The Apostle John would describe it this way. God is always desiring and seeking our highest good, even at the greatest sacrifice to himself. In verse 3, I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Beloved here, it could be translated as dear friends, I love you, and I really wanted to encourage uh, you, but there's something bigger going on here. There are false teachers among you. The, the legacy of your faith in the church is at danger. Notice the passion and zeal, the heart that is behind these words, how they are pinpoint accurate to describe what is going on. It is needful for me to write unto you. Pretty much he is saying, you really need to know what's going on. See, what was happening, there were these spiritual terrorists that had crept in to the church. These were men and women, like I said earlier, who were taking the word of God and they were twisting it. They were distorting it yep. uh, to a works-based salvation. There were, uh, some believe that this was an early sign of Gnosticism where uh, which is saying that Christ is not God. It's not, uh, Christ is not who he says he was. He was just another prophet. Um, to contend for the faith. Um, and I think that's a very appropriate word that I think oftentimes we become complacent. We are okay with just coming and going through the motions. We come and we've got a check on our list to done for Sunday. Yeah. We're good. But the word here, contend, uh, actually means to agonize, uh, fight with intense yeah. effort. It's the same tense of how you would talk to somebody in the military. See, this starts in our own lives. Uh, we remind, we rehearse and stress to ourselves that we are called, beloved, and kept for Jesus. See, we do not turn, turn our cheek when conflict arises, especially when the truth is at hand, when, when the truth is at risk of being distorted. We stand up to those people. Jesus actually gives us the authority to do that. But that doesn't mean about mean being a jerk for Jesus. Uh, so it's not idle. It's not passive. So showing up to church is not the only way we are called to fight for the faith. Amen. That starts Monday morning. Yeah. When you go to work, there is people around you who desperately need the gospel. And it's, uh, you, 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 the Holy Spirit gives you that, that uh, motive to speak to them, and you act on it. You trust the Spirit's working, that uh, the kingdom is going forth from where you stand in the office, in the factory floor, the school, wherever it may be. And one of my favorite books I've read recently, uh, I would really encourage you to get it. It's a short book, but it's called Taking Heaven by Storm, and it's uh, uh, by uh, Thomas Watson. And he goes through uh, this idea of that the battle for the Christian life starts 
through faith and prayer. He says we, we use that against sin as spiritual weapons. See, we agonize over our unbelief because whether we want to believe it or not, there are times we don't believe. We go to God for the pardon of sin. We pray to God for a holy heart, a heart to love Him. We look upon the Word as spiritual army out of which you fetch all your weapons to fight against sin and Satan. See it as divinely inspired to do so. But the second part of that verse uh, where he says, uh, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Uh, See, this isn't just a generic faith in God, but this is the traditional teaching of the church. Yeah. Uh, we can trace our lineage back to the uh, the book of Acts where all this gets started. But also, not just as Christian, but as Baptists here today, we affirm these things, the inerrancy and infallibility of the Holy Scriptures, yeah. the full and eternal deity of Christ, the miraculous virgin birth and the sinless life of Jesus the Messiah, Amen. the historical creation of man and woman made in the image of God, the sanctity of all life from womb to tomb, Amen. the sacredness of marriage between one man and one, man and one woman for life, Amen. the sinfulness of all humans, the substitutionary death of Christ for sinners, the bodily resurrection of Christ from the grave, Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ for sinners. The return of Christ and the assignment of all people, either to eternal blessedness in heaven or eternal condemnation in hell. You see, the, these truths were, have been passed down for 2,019 years, and now they have been handed to us. Uh, this next generation, it is our, our, we are obligated to them to teach them the same thing. Man. And that's what we do when we are at home. We, we spend time together in the Word. We, when we have VBS, <clears throat> Vacation Bible School, we are uh, praying that the gospel <clears throat> would be planted in their hearts so that they can deliver it to their kids Man. and yes. to their kids. Now, even to this day, we are uh, to be safeguarding these truths. That's why I am very cautious about the TV preachers, the health and wealth uh, preachers of the day. There are even churches right here in Jackson County that believe these kinds of things, that there is a, a works based to our faith. It's not true. Anything that says otherwise than the things I just listed is uh, unorthodox and considered heresy. We are called to take up our spiritual weapons against those things, yep. uh, against the sin in our own lives. Yep. So that brings us to our opponents in verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So we were told to just before to, to contend. Now it is showing us why we contend and to know what we believe. Uh, as it says here that these, these men or these people have crept in, and the imagery here is like a snake slithering through the grass. Yeah. And if you've ever been outside, you realize how uh, well these creatures creatures are at deceiving you are before you know it you are right up on it and you jump back that is exactly what they're made to do they're made to deceive Mm -hmm. and so as he continues here uh, as these false teachers crept in uh, they were made to deceive and oftentimes they come in uh, looking like we do saying things that we do and and maybe even uh, believing things we do or say that they are Believing things that we do. The next part, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. I love how the ESV translates it. It says, who long ago were designated for this condemnation. And if we put these translations together, we see exactly what Jude 
is saying. We would say in eternity past, God has already been judging these people. He is using them for his purposes. And we should rest assured that these people don't have the victory. They are uh, just another thing that God is using to bring him glory. He will eventually weed them out. So again, ungodly men. I, I, it's not just the men because, they're, like I said, there are these health, wealth, whatever you want to call it, preachers, and there's women doing it. And it's not just men. It's everybody. Uh, and they were... So some of this is uh, not necessarily that they were... Uh, saying the wrong things but maybe they didn't even believe in god to begin with they were designated for wrath uh, well it says uh, turning the grace of our god into lasciviousness and denying the only lord god and our lord jesus christ uh, turning the grace of our god into lasciviousness to be honest with you i didn't know how to say that word i had to have google translate it for me because we don't talk like that uh but what that is that's a license to sin people uh are using the grace and we've all met those people there may even be people like that sitting here today god's forgiven me i can do whatever i want that that was all took care of on the cross it, god has given me this life to live they're using it as a license to sin and i'm sure that there are people that come to mind when you, uh, when you say that. But we see that freedom in Jesus is not the liberty to do what I want, but the power of what I should. Deny our only God and the Lord Jesus. This is not just a denial of his existence. This is the denial of his power, his kingship, his authority, of who Jesus is. So the question for us today is, uh, what is your life saying about the gospel? Yeah. How, are you here to uh, grow and fight against the faith, or have you grown complacent and stale in your faith? Notice the context that Judah's speaking to. It's the people in the church. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. And as I say these things, we think about the people out there. It's not. It starts right here. Uh, in these moments, we compare our lives to what the Scripture is calling us to. Are we doing those things? We shouldn't be surprised when the world around us looks so lost because so often our Monday through fi Friday denies the kingship of who Jesus is. While we are pointing our finger at the world around us saying that it's going to hell in a handbasket, we forget that we were once lost and blind. Yeah. We are giving the description of these people, but they are right where they need to be, and they need grace. We need grace for our sin. You see, we extend, extend grace, hoping that they would see their error and follow Jesus. We show grace because we have been shown grace one reason that we show grace and love towards those who are in sin is because we remember that our war is not against flesh and blood but it's against the powers and the principalities of this day and age we take up our uh, uh, the sword of the spirit as, as paul calls it earlier and we fight on our knees to take heaven by storm and we know that it will be a fight to the day they lay us in the ground. But we can rest knowing that Jesus has defeated our greatest enemy. Nice. We read in, uh, at the end of our Bibles that Jesus will finally throw Satan into hell where there will no longer be able to torment those who are in Christ. We will dwell with Christ forever in a place where mercy, peace, and love will be among us forever. Amen. And our faith will finally be sight that was delivered to us from the cross. Let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. Uh, and uh, thank you for the opportunity that we uh, 